Welcome to the Power of Purity podcast, the show that empowers men to experience their sexual gift in a healthier way. Now here's your host, Tony Ingrassia. Hey guys, welcome back to the Power of Purity podcast. I'm really glad that you're with me today. And as you probably noticed, this is actually a bonus episode that I'm throwing into this present series that we've been engaged in. And if you've been with me for the past number of weeks, you know that I've done two series back to back. The first one was called 10 Things That Every Husband Should Know About His Wife When It Comes to Sex. And this present series is called 12 Things That Every Wife Should Know About Her Husband When It Comes to Sex. And I got a letter the other day. This was a little bit different because typically when people contact me, it's by text or typically email. And I went to my mailbox at my office the other day, and there was actually a letter in the mailbox from a woman who's been listening to the podcast in general, but specifically to this present series, 12 Things That Every Wife Should Know. And she wanted to respond to the series as she's been listening to it. So she sent me this really anonymous letter. She did sign it with her name, Elaine. I don't know if that's her real name or not. But there was no last name, no email, no phone number, no return address, no contact information. And in fact, the letter was pretty long, about two and a half pages long, typewritten. But then handwritten on the last page, it said, P.S., I'm purposely not including a return address. I don't expect an answer, just wanted to share. And perhaps if any of my points rang true, you could address in a future podcast. Thank you. So when I read this letter, to be honest with you, I was very touched by it, very concerned about it. My heart really went out to Elaine. So I decided just to come on the air, do a bonus episode, and just read Elaine's letter to all of our listeners and kind of respond my way through her letter as she shares her thoughts and observations and comments with me. So I'm going to jump into this letter in just a moment. Before I do, I thought I'd mention to you because through a series of events, I was able to have an interview this past week with a man named Tolian Trevigian. And some of you may or may not know who he is, but he's actually Billy Graham's grandson. And he went into the ministry, and you'll hear the story when I air it, but he became the pastor of one of the largest and most well-known churches in America, Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. And through a series of events, In 2015, he was accused of committing adultery, and as the facts came out, it turns out to be true, he became sexually involved with at least a couple different women, and as a result of this, Tullian lost everything. He lost his marriage because he and his wife got divorced, he lost his family, he lost his church, he lost his ministry, he lost his career. And in a very real sense, he lost his reputation, and he lost himself because his very identity was tied up in all these things, who he was and what he was doing to serve God and serve God's kingdom. So in the darkest of days, he literally despaired of life and contemplated suicide. So I contacted Tullian and asked him, would you consider being a guest on the power of of Purity Podcast because there's a lot of guys that struggle with these issues of sexual purity, and you've been through quite a bit that's happened in your life, so would you be willing to share your story with the guys through this podcast? And much to my delight, he agreed to be a guest on the podcast, and what was going to be a one-hour interview turned into a -a two-and-a-half-hour interview And it was such a good discussion, and I felt so blessed by it, and I'm really excited about it, and I'm looking forward to those upcoming episodes 
So what I intend to do is, after this present series, 12 Things That Every Wife Should Know About Her Husband When It Comes to Sex, I intend to present this interview of Tulian Tavidian. And so I just thought I'd throw this in kind of as a commercial and a promotion so you can be looking forward to that interview. And with that being said, in the meantime, I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into today's episode, this bonus episode, which I'm calling Elaine's Letter. And by the way, let me just mention that, you know, when people write into me, typically I just have their name, and I like to share these letters and comments on the air. So I just want you to know that if you do write to me, Don't be surprised if you hear your comments, your thoughts, your letter on the air of the podcast, because I do like to share these things. I will say that if a person wrote to me and specifically asked me to not share their letter or their comment, then of course I would respect that. But what I wanted to say is that I feel that I can read Elaine's letter, especially because she said here in her handwriting at the end of her letter, I just wanted to share, and perhaps if any of my points rang true, you could address them in a future podcast. So that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm not sure, but if I'm a betting man, I'd bet a nickel that Elaine probably didn't expect to hear her letter so quickly after she wrote it, but I felt led to respond accordingly. And again, the letter is a little bit long, so what I'm going to do is kind of work my way through. I'm going to read a paragraph at a time and then comment. And in the body of Elaine's letter, she gets to five main points or observations that she's sharing with me. So we'll work our way through those five points. But in the way of introduction, Elaine says this. Hi, Tony. First of all, I just want to say thank you for your ministry and for all your insights and efforts that are blessing men and women every single day. I believe I've listened to every episode of your podcast and have also watched your video series with my husband. I am sincerely grateful for your honesty and your obedience to God to share your story. I'm writing today when I just finished listening to part four of your podcast series entitled, 12 Things Every Wife Should Know About Her Husband When It Comes to Sex. I hope you don't mind if I share my feedback. To be perfectly honest, my stomach is in knots and I'm feeling quite triggered after your frank discussion. I'm praying that God allows me to be open to accept truth and any information that I need to be a better wife. I also have to acknowledge I believe that some of what you are sharing seems to counter my experience, and I just want to share. I'll try to explain. So let me just respond to the opening paragraph of Elaine's letter with three comments of my own. And the first one is this. Thank you, Elaine, for your compliments concerning the Power of Purity ministry. I'm glad that you and your husband found the podcast and the video series. I'm very flattered that you'd take the time to listen to every single podcast and to watch all 30 of the videos in the Power of Purity video series. And I do pray that it's been a blessing and an encouragement to both you and your husband on your journey. And in addition, let me just say, Elaine, that I really appreciate you taking the time to write me this letter to share your thoughts and your heart with me and to let me know what you're thinking and feeling, and to give me the opportunity to respond accordingly. So thank you for that. The second thing I wanted to say is that Elaine mentions that after listening to part four of this present series, 12 Things Every Wife Should Know About Her Husband When It Comes to Sex, that her stomach was in knots and that she was feeling quite triggered by my frank discussion. And let me just say that while it's certainly not my intention to get anybody's stomach in knots as a result of listening to this podcast, that it doesn't really surprise me that this could be the response that some people might have to some of the things that I'm sharing. And that, in fact, 
This is the very reason that I stated in the introductory comments to this series that the principles Tony shares through this series might be surprising to some, if not shocking, but they will give women unusual, if not unexpected, insights into the world of men and sex. So quite frankly, I'm not surprised that some women, if not most women, would find this series to be somewhat disruptive in some way as they listen to some of the things that I'm sharing about men and sex. And let me just say again that while it's certainly not my intention to cause anybody to become disrupted or upset as they listen to the Power of Purity podcast or in the verbiage of Elaine's letter, it's certainly not my intention to get anybody's stomach tied up in knots because they've listened to the podcast. But it is my intention to be as direct and honest and forthright and transparent as I can possibly be about these various issues and topics as we discuss them, and to share with you, my listening audience, as honestly and sincerely as I possibly can, my viewpoint and understanding of these various topics and issues. And let me just say again that I fully recognize that you, my dear listener, have the distinct advantage to either agree or disagree with my viewpoint or opinion on any particular subject. And in reality, I don't even claim to be all that smart, and I don't claim to have a corner on the market of truth. And just because I say something does not necessarily mean that it's right or that it's the truth. And you, as the listener, have the right and the privilege to disagree with me any time that you don't agree with my particular viewpoint or opinion on any particular topic that I might happen to be talking about. But with that being said, I do trust that you'll always give me the benefit of the doubt, even when you do disagree with me, and I trust that you sense the stature of my heart in this entire matter and that you do believe that I am sincerely attempting to be as honest and real and transparent and forthcoming as I possibly can about these various subjects and topics as we work our way through them. And the third comment I had concerning Elaine's opening paragraph of her letter is something she said when she says, I'm praying God allows me to be open and accept truth and any information I need to be a better wife. And I'd just like to say that I think that that was a totally awesome and beautiful thing for Elaine to say. And as the host of the Power of Purity podcast, there's nothing more that I could ask of any listener than for you to have an open heart and an open mind to the things that I'm sharing through the podcast, and for you to at least consider these things and pray about these things before God and to ask God to help you discern what is right and what is wrong and what might apply to your life and what doesn't. Or what I've said before, it's like eating a steak, right? Take the meat, throw away the bones, and it's up to you before God to decide what's meat, what's bones. And then to be open to accepting and applying to your life those things that you decide might be helpful and beneficial to you and to your marriage on your journey. So with that being said, the next little line in Elaine's letter says this, you mention over and over again in this series about how women need to recognize that men need sex with their wives often, and that if women comply, this will meet this embedded desire in their husband's body. Well, There's one thing Elaine says here that I kind of am having an allergic reaction to when she suggests that I mention over and over again that women need to comply with their husband's need to have sex on a regular basis. And while it is true that I'm attempting to help women understand what I believe are some basic needs and desires that most men struggle with when it comes to sex, And while it's true that most men do have a higher sex drive than their wife, and they want and need sex more than their wife does, 
I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with Elaine's choice of words here when she essentially suggests that women should just automatically comply with their husband's need for sex. Because to me, the word comply essentially implies the idea of duty sex or obligation sex or responsibility sex. And the word comply implies the idea that you're being forced into doing something that you really don't want to be doing, but that you're somehow required to do it or that you're being compelled to do it even against your own will or conscience. Well, I really don't want to do it, but I guess I'll comply. So I just want to point that out because I really believe that healthy sex within marriage should always be a we thing and not a me thing, and there should always be a kind of healthy mutuality that exists between a couple when they have sex. Or said another way, sex happens because they both want it to happen. They're both excited about it. They both look forward to it. They both anticipate it. They both want to participate. So it's not that somebody's complying like out of duty. It's more of a want to thing than a have to thing. Or said another way, sex should be happening between said couple because both people in the relationship want and desire for said sex to be happening. And nobody's participating in said sex because they're being coerced or compelled or required or forced to participate in any way whatsoever. And just for the sake of clarity, I want to remind us that at the beginning of this present podcast series, 12 Things Every Wife Should Know About Her Husband, I really tried to go above and beyond the call of duty to establish this point with absolute clarity that under no circumstances whatsoever, 100% absolutely, without exception, should any woman ever be pressured or coerced into having sex that's in any way a violation of her own conscience or personhood, including even sex with her own husband. And with that being said, it therefore brings me to Elaine's first point of the five different points and five different paragraphs that she shares with me throughout her letter. And that first point is this. It feels like you're assuming that wives are not already sharing in that experience with their husbands. I can tell you that I went into marriage believing that it was my duty and pleasure to be available to my husband. And although we had sex an average of four times a week, Even when I was pregnant and had small babies, he still stepped out of our marriage to satisfy himself in other ways. This went on for 25 years without me knowing about his infidelities. When I discovered his secret life, it just about destroyed me because I had given myself completely to him and it still was not enough. To me, that doesn't seem like I had any control over my husband's fidelity. He was going to find sex outside of our marriage with regular sex or not. It had nothing to do with our sex life. What he was looking for was beyond what any wife could give. So yeah, hearing you say that women need to have more sex with their husbands triggered me because that was a lie I believed and it failed to protect me. And with that being said by Elaine, I have two primary thoughts I'd like to share in response to this paragraph of Elaine's letter. And the first one concerns her comment that I seem to be assuming something. I'm assuming that women aren't already willingly sharing in the sexual experience with their husband. And in response to this comment by Elaine, I'd simply say that I do not intend to automatically assume that most women do not willingly share in the sexual experience with her husband, and I'd say, thank God for those women, and thank God for those marriages that are healthy enough and functional enough that both the husband and the wife are able to be sexually present to one another and sexually available to one another, and that they're able to enjoy one another in this way 
which is exactly what I believe God intends for husbands and wives to enjoy within the context of their marriage. But with that being said, I'll also say that I'm aware of the fact that sex is a really big problem for a whole lot of married couples, and that sex causes a lot of hurt and confusion and pain and misunderstanding and disorientation and anger and angst and upset and upheaval in a lot of marriages. And in fact, I'd suggest that this is the very reason the power of purity exists, because it's my sincere heart and hope that through the power of purity, both men and women, both husbands and wives, might find some information and some guidance, maybe some wisdom, maybe some insights, that will help them be healthier together within the context of their marriage relationship. So, in reality, I'd say that I'm not assuming that wives are not already willingly sharing in the sexual experience with their husband, and instead, I'd encourage all of my listeners, both men and women, when listening to the Power of Purity podcast, to simply consider the old adage, if the shoe fits, wear it. Or said another way, if the particular principle that I happen to be discussing at any particular point happens to be something that you do not struggle with within the context of your marriage, then praise be to God, because you're really doing great in that particular area. And in much the same way, if the particular principle that I happen to be discussing at any particular point is something that you're really struggling with, in your own heart and marriage, then maybe that's something you can look at and think about and consider and struggle with and maybe pray about as you contemplate how that particular issue or topic might apply in your heart and life and situation and marriage. And I'll give you an example of what I'm trying to say here. In the last episode of the podcast, I shared the fifth principle of the 12 things that every wife should know about her husband when it comes to sex. And the fifth principle was this. Your husband would like you to want to have sex with him. And if you heard that episode, you understand that the operative word of this principle is the word want, that your husband wants you or would like you to want to have sex. To not have sex with him because you have to have sex, but because you want to have sex. So the fact is, this particular principle could go either way, right? Because if you're in the place as a wife in your life that you actually want to have sex with your husband, then this principle doesn't really apply to you because you already want to have sex with your husband. So that's totally awesome. So praise be to God. And it's not like you have work to do on that particular area of your heart and life. And you don't have to figure out how to want to have sex with your husband because you happen to be in the place, praise be to God, where you already want to have sex with your husband. So I'd suggest that you should simply be encouraged by this particular principle that you're doing pretty good with this particular issue. And it's not really something that you need to work on. Or it could be that when you hear this fifth principle, your husband would like you to want to have sex with him, that it might provoke within you a kind of self-examination and or self-reflection because you, in fact, are not in the place where you want to have sex with your husband. And that if this is the place where you happen to be at in your sexual relationship with your husband, then maybe you'd at least consider how this issue applies to your heart and life and marriage and consider if you have some work to do in this particular area of your heart and life and marriage. And the second thing I wanted to share in response to this paragraph of Elaine's letter essentially concerns the part where Elaine talks about her willingness to have sex with her husband four times a week throughout their marriage even when she was pregnant and had small children, 
and how this still wasn't enough sex for her husband, and how the entire time her husband was cheating on her and acting out sexually within the context of the marriage. And what I'd like to say to Elaine about this is that absolutely, 100%, that your husband's actions and choices are 100% on him and not on you, and that he's 100% accountable and responsible for his own actions and choices and decisions. And it sounds like to me, from what Elaine wrote in the letter, that she went way above the call of duty in her attempt to be sexually present to her husband and to meet his sexual needs within the marriage by her willingness to have sex with him four times a week on an average. And the fact that he still went outside the marriage and that he chose to cheat on Elaine, that he chose to break his marriage covenant with Elaine, says way more about him than it says about her. And in fact, I don't know for sure because I've never spoken to Elaine or her husband that I know of, but it sounds like to me that her husband has a sexual addiction that's way out of control and that would be virtually impossible for any wife to fulfill. And in view of that, I do not think that it's Elaine's responsibility to somehow try to have so much sex with her husband that it becomes her responsibility to somehow keep him from acting out or cheating on her within the context of the marriage. That's crazy. And in addition, I do not think that his acting out and cheating on Elaine was somehow Elaine's fault because she wasn't having enough sex with him. And I think his actions, his choices, and his decisions are entirely his fault and his responsibility. And with that being said, it brings me to Elaine's second point in the letter, which says this. You also say that women need to understand how important orgasm is to our husbands. I agree that that information is important, but I'd like to remind you that many of us wives have been living our entire marriage with men who lie to us. My husband worked very hard to keep the depths of his sexual drive a secret. He now admits that he didn't want to tell me how much he thought about sex and how much he craved it, even wanting more sex within minutes of having an orgasm. Because he worked so hard at denying his desires, he convinced me that he was much less sexual than he really was. I trusted my husband, and I believed him. I wonder how many other wives have experienced the same thing, their husbands actually hiding their sexual depth and causing the wives to form misguided beliefs. In other words, when husbands keep secrets or when they create a holy facade, they actually perpetrate a harmful and disingenuous representation of themselves. I would love to hear from other men if they purposely misled their wives out of shame, or fear that they'd get caught, etc. And what I'd like to say in response to this point, Elaine, is, wow, I agree 100% with what you're saying here, and I want to affirm what you're saying. But I do think there's one important distinction to be made here, and that distinction has something to do, in a sense, with the difference between a man having a healthy relationship with his orgasm and a very unhealthy relationship with his orgasm. And while it's true that it's important for men to be able to have orgasms, and while it's true that men need to have orgasms, it's not true that a man should be enslaved to his orgasm, and it's not true that a man should be controlled by his orgasm, and it's not true that a man should ever express his sexual gift or have an orgasm apart from his wife. Or maybe here's another way to say what I'm trying to say here, that there's a big difference between a man expressing his sexual gift with his wife and having his orgasm with his wife within the context of a committed, mutual, exclusive, and loving relationship 
and a man being so driven by his sexual appetite and orgasm that he's compelled to act out in violation against his wife and his marriage vows, and by so doing, he enters into a duplicitous and deceitful and lying relationship with his wife, where he's now living a lie within the most important relationship of his life, God forbid. And with that being said, it brings me to the third point of Elaine's letter, where she says this, You mentioned that 67% of Christian men are watching pornography on a regular basis. I think it's important to acknowledge that their exposure to pornography and graphic novel images changes their brains and changes their behavior. I've heard you talk about how women are usually the partner with the low sex drive, but I would like to ask you to consider that one main reason women have a lower drive than their husbands is because men who have been exposed to hours and hours of pornography, who have allowed themselves to participate in fantasy, who have paid for sex acts, etc., are not in tune with what their wives find sexy and arousing. I suspect that what most men experience when they turn to sex outside of marriage is a very selfish act where they get all the pleasure from a woman with very little effort at all. Perhaps they've paid for a woman to dance for them or to strip for them, and these women do their job and they pretend that they're aroused by this man because that's how they get paid. And men pay women to perform sex acts because they want the pleasure without having to put out any effort. That isn't real life, and wives can't be expected to be aroused by a husband who only knows how to ask and take. But unfortunately, that is who men become when they spend so many hours fantasizing, watching pornography, and paying for sex. It's only honest to say that men are changed from these experiences. They are out of tune with what a mutually pleasurable experience looks like. It isn't always that women have a lower sex drive, but instead, we are not aroused by a man who has become numb to our needs and is only satisfied if he doesn't have to do any work. Speaking very personally here, I am an attractive woman. I've taken very good care of myself, and I've not gained weight. I'm told that I look 10 years younger than my age. I'm only saying that to make this point. My husband was so acclimated to always being on the receiving end of sex that he would often turn me down unless I was able to have sex without needing foreplay. It's not worth it, he would say. I know it wasn't because I was unattractive or because I was unappealing. What I didn't know at the time was it was because he could go to his computer and find a woman who would do all the work and he could sit back and just receive. He also told me recently that he would get regular happy ending massages when he traveled. I asked him if the women were beautiful and if he got to choose who gave him the massage. He said that most of the time he just took the massage from whoever came into the room and there were times the woman was pretty but there were also times when she was much older than him and not attractive at all. Still, because he could just lay there and receive, it was arousing and gave him what he was looking for. So it didn't really matter if I took good care of myself or not. He still found pleasure in other women because, when paid, they would give and not ask for anything in return. This sexual dynamic doesn't work in a marriage and women's bodies intuitively know when their husband isn't being faithful. We can't respond when we don't feel valued or worth it. And again, in response to that paragraph, I would just say wow to everything that Elaine is writing here, and I want to say that I agree with the points that she's establishing here. I agree that when men watch pornography, and they're being inundated and saturated and marinated in pornography, that it profoundly affects their understanding and perspective of what healthy sexuality is and what healthy relationship is. I think it inflames lust within them. 
I think it distorts their understanding of what's normal sexuality within the context of a marriage. I think it causes them to objectify women. I think it causes them to function in the realm of what I call lust sex instead of love sex. I think it provokes within them a sexual selfishness that makes them a sexual user and a sexual taker and causes them to have a narcissistic me attitude about sex instead of an appropriate and healthy and loving we attitude about sex. And I think it inflames within men an inordinate and disproportionate sexual desire and appetite that then tempts them and compels them to act outside of God's given parameters for their sexual gift, which is essentially wife-sized sex. So for these, and I'm quite sure for many other reasons, pornography has devastating effects in the hearts and lives and souls and sexuality and marriages of those men who are indulging in these things contrary to God's will. And further, I agree completely with Elaine's assessment that these type of habits and behaviors are completely counterproductive to successful and healthy relationship or successful and healthy sexuality within the context of marriage. And on a final note, I'd just like to say concerning this paragraph of Elaine's letter that I'm kind of shocked and horrified, and I'm not shocked and horrified at the same time, if you know what I mean, that her husband has said to Elaine that he's unwilling to have sex with her because he doesn't want to bother with the foreplay that's necessary for him to get to said sex with his wife. And I think that this is absolutely horrible and terrible and sad and pathetic and essentially sickening, and it's profoundly selfish and narcissistic and uncaring and unkind and unloving because it's essentially the equivalent of saying to his wife, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. In other words, I'm not really interested in you as a person, and I'm not really interested in you as my wife, and I'm not really interested in being connected with you and enjoying you and having an intimate and loving experience with you, but I am interested in using you for my own selfish and narcissistic pleasure, or said another way, I'm willing to use you and your body, and I'm willing to sacrifice you and your body on the altar of my orgasm. Or said another way, I'm essentially willing to use your body as a glorified mechanism for me to masturbate myself with, and for me to get the sexual experience that I want to have here, but this whole thing isn't about you and I together, and it's not about intimacy and connection and union and love. It's not about tenderness. And if I have to take the time to experience foreplay with you, which means I have to wait to get to the part that I really want to get to, then it just isn't worth it to me, and you're not really worth it to me. Or said another way, I'm very willing to use you and take from you, but I'm not willing to give to you and to invest in you in any way. Then let me just say, Elaine, that in this scenario, in my opinion, you have every right to feel completely used and abused and hurt and betrayed and disrespected and dishonored and rejected and unloved And quite frankly, I don't see how you could ever possibly, under any conditions or circumstances, have any kind of sexual experience with a man who's willing to treat you this way. It's absolutely pathetic. It's absolutely terrible. And in fact, I'd encourage you to establish some very necessary and healthy boundaries around yourself that would never allow your husband or any other person, to ever treat you this way ever again, until and unless your husband was willing to undergo a serious process of repentance and counseling and self-examination and change. 
to the point of him gaining the ability to offer you the love and respect and kindness and tenderness and attention that you rightfully deserve as a daughter of God and an image bearer of God. Or said another way, shame on your husband for treating you this way. And shame on any other husband who would ever treat his wife this way whatsoever. And with that being said, it brings me to the fourth point of Elaine's letter, which says this. You also mentioned that men come into their marriage with an existing sexual rhythm that probably involves daily orgasms, if not more. Are you saying that a woman needs to adjust her rhythm to match her husband's existing rhythm? I'm having a hard time believing that because a young man has found the time to masturbate every day of the week as a youth, that that rhythm is actually healthy and needed. Honestly, can we talk about how orgasms can actually be addicting, like cocaine or other drugs? Can we talk about how that young men may have been drawn to masturbate as a way to cope with anxiety or trauma or loneliness or insecurity, etc., and how growing up and maturing should mean that they deal with these underlying issues and get help rather than expecting a wife to supply sex as their drug of choice. Speaking personally again, now that my husband has become clean about his past and has agreed to only have his sexual needs met by me, he is needing sex multiple times a day, which is mostly unrealistic. He says that sex is the most important need in his life. He can't imagine a life without sex. When he is anxious or depressed or lonely, the answer is always sex. In his addiction, he gave up friendships with other men, hobbies, reading books, exercise. He only worked very hard and then relaxed with some form of sex. He traveled often, so if it wasn't with me, he could find what he needed on the road. Now that he is being faithful, he wants me to be available for sex all the time. He still doesn't have male friendships. He hasn't taken up exercise or new hobbies. He still works far too many hours, by choice. What I'm saying is that his sexual rhythm comes in the absence of other healthy habits and routines. He learned that he could get all his needs met by sex, but he needed multiple women and outlets to do that. Can we talk about the fact that men need other healthy rhythms in their life besides sex? I feel like sex has just become this easy default for men because they can always turn to it, even just pleasuring themselves, and they have neglected to develop healthy routines that make them better men, husbands, fathers, and friends. And how many of us wives feel less like valuable humans and more like objects in the eyes of our husbands? When sex is a drug, then the wives become just the next hit. Can we talk about how men make their wives feel used? And again, in response to what Elaine is saying in this paragraph of her letter, let me just say that I think she's making some really good points here and that I agree with her wholeheartedly. In the second sentence of this paragraph, Elaine asks a very important question. Are you saying that a woman needs to adjust her rhythm to match her husband's existing rhythm? And the answer to that question is absolutely not. And I'm a little surprised, Elaine, that you would ask this question because you say in the beginning paragraph of your letter that you've listened not only to every episode of the Power of Purity podcast, but also to all 30 video episodes of the Power of Purity video conference. And there's no way a person should be able to listen to the overall body of work that I've presented through the power of purity and be able to conclude in any way that I've ever suggested that a woman should just automatically adjust her sexual rhythm to match her husband's embedded sexual rhythm. And in fact, quite to the contrary, I've advocated over and over again that every couple needs to enter into a sexual alliance 
where they commit to experience and express their sexual gifts exclusively with one another, and that every couple needs to find a corresponding sexual rhythm within the context of their relationship that works for them as a couple. And I've even offered an example on several occasions, and I've given this example before where let's assume, for example, that there's a husband for real who would like to have sex every single day or maybe even multiple times a day, but his wife would be happy to have sex once a month if even that, she could basically take it or leave it. And so there's quite a disparity here in this marriage, and this disparity can cause a lot of hurt and tension and confusion. So I'd advocate that if this couple is going to be healthy together, if they're serious about honoring God and honoring one another with the expression of their sexual gift within the context of their marriage, then they're going to have to move toward one another and they're going to have to figure out a sexual rhythm that works for them. So in this metaphorical example, I might suggest that this couple might try to have sex once a week. And in so doing, they forge a compromise that works in their marriage. And I'd say to the husband, dude, you're not going to get sex every single day. Just forget about it because that's not who your wife is. And I'm going to say to the wife, dude, to let your husband have sex with you just once a month or once every couple few months is not going to work for your husband because that's not who your husband is. So if you guys are serious about this thing, you're going to have to move toward one another and you're going to have to compromise and you're going to have to serve one another. As it says in Ephesians 5.21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, and you're going to have to find a rhythm that works for the two of you within the context of your marriage. So in no way have I ever suggested that a woman just needs to move toward her husband and just assume the same rhythm that her husband has and that he prefers. And I think this is something that a couple has to work on together. And the second thing I'd like to acknowledge in this paragraph of Elaine's letter concerns her observation that many men have learned to essentially use their orgasm as their drug of choice and to use their orgasm as the primary emotional coping mechanism of their life. And the fact is, you heard my story. This is exactly what I was doing for years and years in my own life although I didn't really understand that that's what I was doing at the time. And it's what many men are doing with their orgasm. And I'd just like to say that I agree completely with Elaine's assessment that it is not a wife's duty or responsibility to somehow try to satisfy her husband's sexual addiction. It's impossible for her to do. She cannot satisfy his insatiable need for orgasms if he's a sex addict because it's just not reality and it's not healthy and it's not practical because if a man has a sexual addiction, the solution to his sexual addiction is not for his wife to try to have sex with him 27 times a week or 37 times a week because all that would accomplish is the reality of her becoming responsible to somehow satisfy his unquenchable addiction. All it would be doing is reinforcing his addiction. And instead, the remedy for his problem concerns the reality that he needs to deal with his sexual addiction, and he needs to quit perpetrating his sexual addiction upon his poor wife. And what this man really needs to have happen is he needs the chains of his sexual addiction to be broken from his life and soul through the power of Christ, through the truth of Christ, through the light of Christ, and the healing of Christ, and the redemption of Christ, and the blood of Christ. And I'm living proof that that can happen. That if a man has a sexual addiction, if he's had a sexual addiction, 
He's not doomed to continue to live the rest of his life under the power of his sexual addiction. And if he's willing to do the work that he needs to do, if he's willing to look at himself, if he's willing to get in a recovery program, if he's willing to go to counseling, if he's willing to deal with his addiction, then that addiction can be broken in Jesus' name, and he can become a healthier man which means it creates the possibility that the marriage itself can become healthier. Praise be to God. And in view of these things, I would suggest that a wife in Elaine's position needs to have the self-respect and the strength to no longer allow her husband to perpetrate his sexual addiction upon her. Because again, as was stated and restated at the beginning of this present series of the podcast, 12 Things Every Wife Should Know About Her Husband When It Comes to Sex, under no circumstances whatsoever, 100%, absolutely, without exception, should any woman ever be pressured or coerced into having sex that's in any way a violation of her own conscience or personhood, even sex with her own husband. And with that being said, it brings me to the fifth and the final point and paragraph of Elaine's letter, which says this. Lastly, here is something I've wondered about since discovering my husband's addiction a few years ago. What if God put this deep desire in men's bodies by design, not so they could find comfort in their wives, but so that they would always have unmet desires and would have to come daily, humbly, to God for comfort, protection, to meet all their needs. As a wife, I'm feeling incredible pressure to meet this insatiable desire of my husband. I would love to ask God to explain to me how it is that I'm supposed to carry this huge responsibility knowing even when I give all I have to give to my husband sexually, every day, I will never be enough. Even then, he still wants more and has to fight to resist the pull to go outside our marriage. Perhaps that pull is not sexual rhythm, but it's God saying, draw near to me and let me fill the holes in your heart. And in response to what Elaine has written here, I'd like to say that I think she articulated this particular point in just an excellent, very beautiful, tender way. And I agree that a wife should not accept the responsibility or pressure to somehow try to satisfy her husband's sexual addiction, because as already noted, the fact is, she will never be able to satisfy that which cannot be satisfied. And therefore, the solution that Elaine suggests here is very well taken, it's very wise, that ultimately, if we as men are going to be healthier men and more godly men, that it has way more to do with who we are with God than who we are with our wife or who we are with sex. And it's going to have something to do with my relationship with God and my willingness to seek God, my willingness to bring myself humbly under the authority of God and of Christ, and to allow God to work deeply and powerfully in my heart and soul, and to allow God to break my sexual addiction, and to help me bring my sexual gift and my orgasm under the authority of God himself, and for me to begin to honor God and honor my wife with the expression of my sexual gift. Praise be to God. In short, another way to say it, which I think Elaine articulated so beautifully, is that our wife can't take the place of God in a man's heart and life, and sex can't take the place of God. And we need to let God become our all in all. We need to let God become our true and living God, the thing that we love and worship, and not our orgasm anymore, the thing that we serve and love and worship. And with that being said, you guys, Elaine closes her letter by saying this, Tony, you're so kind for taking the time to read my letter and hear my heart. I'm grateful that you're discussing these tough topics 
and appreciate your perspective. I pray that I haven't offended you with my questions. Thank you again, Elaine. So, in conclusion to this letter, I want to say to Elaine, Elaine, I I trust that you're going to hear this because you've said that you listen to every podcast episode, but I just want to say that you're welcome for me taking the time to read your letter and to hear your heart, and I'd like to thank you for listening to the Power of Purity podcast and for taking the time to share your thoughts and your heart with me, and I just want to say God bless you. And Elaine, just one more thing on a personal note. I'd really like to humbly suggest that you and your husband might seriously consider the possibility of engaging a professional therapeutic process because, quite frankly, it sounds to me like your husband is still struggling with his sexual addiction, and I think he's trying to perpetrate his sexual addiction upon you. You said in the context of the letter that your husband, through the ministry of the power of purity, he's brought himself into the concept of wife-size sex. He understands that he can't go outside the marriage and have orgasms anymore, so he's pledged himself to be faithful to you and to only express his sexual gift with you and to have orgasms with you. But the problem is that if he's still a sex addict, all that means is now you become the sole object of his sexual addiction. And I'm suggesting that you do not allow him to make you the object of his sexual addiction. He's requiring you to do something that you cannot do, you were never called to do, And so the remedy has to do with him dealing with his sexual addiction. And it just sounds to me like you're still struggling with accepting the responsibility of his sexual addiction and his orgasm. And I don't think you should do that. So in my estimation from this letter, it just sounds like you guys have a lot of work to do. So I just would encourage you guys to consider the possibility of seeking out some guidance, some wisdom, some counseling, some therapy as you work on becoming healthier together. And may I just say that that's exactly what my wife and I did. We were a big mess. We were an absolute mess. And at the center of our mess was the issue of sex. We were both very deeply broken. I was a young man with a sexual addiction. My wife was a young lady with a sexual aversion, and we could not function healthy sexually in the context of our marriage. But we eventually ended up going into this process of therapy, and God gave us our slow miracle. And it was a messy process, and it was a hard process, but it was a beautiful process, and it was a redemptive process. And if you guys are willing to do the work that's necessary, to journey on God's healing path, I have no doubt that God will give you and your husband the same miracle that God gave me and my wife, and I pray that you guys might consider doing that so you can be healthier together than you've ever been, and so you can enter into the beautiful and loving marriage that God has always intended for you to share together. And with that being said, you guys, that concludes Elaine's letter, and I recognize that this is really a long episode here, and I would normally cut it in half because I try to keep my episodes at about 30 minutes, but since this is a bonus episode and I'm essentially inserting this as a bonus into this particular series, 12 Things That Every Wife Should Know About Her Husband When It Comes to Sex, I'm not going to cut this in half. It's a long episode, but if you've chosen to listen to it, I pray that it has been a blessing and an encouragement to you, and I thank you, as always, for listening and for being with me on this journey. And with that being said, I want to say a prayer specifically for Elaine and her husband, and by proxy, in Jesus' name, I pray that this prayer would extend to each and every person that hears it. 
So, Father in heaven, God, we just thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for your love, for your kindness, for your patience, for your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, your redemption, God. And we know that there's no problem too hard for you, God, no situation too hard for you, no situation outside of your redemptive reach. And I just thank you, God, that Elaine took the time to write me this letter. I pray that some of my thoughts and response might be helpful and encouraging to her. And I just pray, O oh God, your grace, your mercy, your kindness, the light of God, the truth of God, the healing of God, the redemption of God over Elaine and over her marriage. And I pray you would work deeply and powerfully in her husband's heart and soul. I pray that he might be willing to face and admit his sexual addiction, that he might be willing to begin his recovery process, that he might be willing to go to counseling, to maybe participate in a sex addicts group, to do whatever he needs to do to begin to deal with his addiction. And Lord, I pray that you would be with Elaine. I pray that you give her wisdom and strength, God, to know how to live with her husband in a loving way and to not allow him to continue to perpetrate his sexual addiction upon her. It feels like codependency, God, that in a way I pray she would no longer be codependent to participate in his addiction with him. So, Lord, I know these things are very difficult, so I pray that you would just help Elaine and her husband on this journey, and I pray that, Lord, they would be inspired to do the work that they need to do as they seek to move toward you, God, as they seek to move toward one another, as they seek to be healthier together than they've ever been before. And I pray your blessings, O God, over Elaine and her husband, and over every single listener of this podcast episode. O God, we say that you are awesome. We say that we need you, Lord. We say that you are high and lifted up. And we're just so grateful for your mercies, God, for your love, for your kindness. And we say, O God, that we love you this day. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. And with that prayer, you guys, I'm going to let you go. I hope you've enjoyed this bonus episode of the Power of Purity podcast, Elaine's Letter. And I'll look forward to seeing you guys this next week as we continue our journey in the next episode of the Power of Purity podcast. In the meantime, God bless you. Have a great day. Have a great week. And be blessed in Jesus' name. See you later. Bye-bye now. Thanks for listening. Visit powerofpurity.org for more resources and information. And if this podcast has been helpful or encouraging, please invite a friend to listen. Until next time, remember, there's power in purity.